Hi, it's Daniel Priya here, and uh, welcome to another episode of Pogchamp's Blunders Explained. Together, we're going to be looking at the blunders played in the match between Aflor and Wagamama TV. And uh, first of all, we need to point out that uh, these players are not professionals, and uh, even amongst professionals, it's uh, absolutely normal to blunder. Chess is a very complicated game, and uh, the reason we're going through this is uh, to really learn something from these mistakes. A great way to learn is to learn from your own mistakes, but another great way to learn is to learn from someone else's mistakes. So we can all learn something from this, and uh, let's uh, go through the blunders that uh, happen during these games so that we can, uh, first of all, identify the underlying patterns behind this blunder. So we're not only looking at the chess board, but understanding the psychology behind that, the inner game of chess, not only the outer game of chess. And at the same time, understand how we can avoid these uh, mistakes in our own games. So the first game of the, the mini match, a two game match they played, started with uh, the move e4. In this game, we have uh, Afthor with the white pieces and uh, Wagamama TV with the black pieces. So the game continued with uh, c6, which is a uh, Karakon defense. And uh, this move, uh, bishop to c4, is actually uh, a move that it's playable. And uh, again, this, uh, as you can see, this is shown as a book move. However, uh, this is actually a very dubious move. Now, the reason this was played very likely is uh, not because this player uh, Afthor prepared uh, this gambit line, but primarily because uh, it looks like he probably wasn't prepared against something other than uh, e4, e5, and therefore, because after e4, e5, it's very natural for, for him to play bishop c4, playing an Italian or a, a bishop opening, as it's called as well. After the c6, somehow Afthor realized, okay, let's just get into some familiar territory and play something similar. And uh, usually in the Italian as well, the bishop retreats to b3. So right now the player is following general patterns rather than understanding the specifics of the position. And uh, this is actually quite early in the game. So first of all, we may argue that a little bit of preparation is needed. Uh, but at the same time, a mistake that is very, very common is really... Uh, the lack of uh, specific um, it's really the lack of a specific focus on the actual position and just simply trying to play something that somehow looks familiar or sounds familiar and this is something that uh, of course you want to avoid in your game so uh, this move here again it's something that potentially is the theoretical, but it's not really a good move because uh, black can already win a pawn here. And uh, it's a gambit. Again, you can keep playing, but the computer already uh, absolutely loves black and the uh, practice would normally uh, confirm that. However, very interesting in this position, black probably reasoned the same way. Said, hey, I don't know this gambit, I don't want to take the pawn, I don't want to fall into some uh, strange preparation sort of thing, so I'm going to go e5. And you can't really argue with that, you can't really argue with um, that type of thinking, however, you know, if you want to get better at chess, you'll have to accept the challenge your opponent is, is, uh, is presenting you with. So if your opponent is giving you a pawn and it's uh, a dubious pawn offer, especially if it's a move 2, a move 3, like usually you actually... Uh, want to take that. You're not going to get checkmated anytime soon anyway, and uh, you're just going to be up a pawn. So um, again, we're looking at the reasoning behind these moves, and uh, both players here are trying to steer the game um, to familiar territory, and by all means, I definitely agree with that strategy in general, but sometimes the specifics of the position demand for a different treatment. And if you want to get better at chess, uh, uh, you really want to uh, give the position what the position requires rather than trying to impose your own way to play which is not always meeting the demands of the position. So very important point to keep in mind. Uh, here, okay, the game continues. We're not going to analyze uh, the game. We're just looking at the blunder. So the game continues with uh, a few natural moves. And uh, actually, Black's already getting in trouble here. Now, the reason is after bishop g5 there is a threat so here there's a, some sort of like mutual blunder here bishop e7 is fine but here h3 was played when in reality uh, there's already a big problem on d5 here so 
what the white player is missing in uh, this particular position is that there are certain relationships between all these different pieces and these relationships are very relevant and in particular there's a tension that can be resolved resulting in a material gain and uh, i understand that some players don't want to just give up a bishop for a knight unless they see that they get a clear advantage out of that but in this particular case it's uh, pretty clear that white is just netting a pawn and uh, this is uh, again not something that requires any specific calculation this is based on awareness of what your pieces are doing in a given position. So again, it's not like, hey, let me calculate, there is a tactic here. It's not really about that. A lot of players will make this mistake, like, oh, I, I didn't calculate that correctly, or I didn't want to calculate that. Or sometimes, hey, my intuition told me that it was dangerous to give up the bishop for a knight, but in reality, it's not your intuition telling you that it's your laziness. Sometimes laziness, will uh, dress up as intuition and you think that your intuition is telling you now it's not going to work but in reality uh, again it's your laziness uh, your laziness you don't want to fall for this trap so here if you simply um again without really calculating anything specific it's just a two move sequence really uh, what you want to do is fully be aware of what every single piece is doing so as soon as you put the bishop on g5 Attacking this knight on f6, you want to be aware that d5 is weakened. That is a relationship between pieces and pawns and squares. You have a bishop on b3 and a knight on c3, great. That means that there is pressure on d5. You already know that. You don't even have to think if, you know, there is a pawn on d5, you're winning a pawn, you're losing a pawn. It's not the point. The point is bishop on d3, knight on c3, pressure on d5. It should be kind of automatic. And again, bishop on g5, knight on f6 pressure on d5 really yes because the knight on f6 is defending the pawn on d5 the bishop is a dark square bishop now because dark square bishop is not directly controlling d5 but indirectly can remove a defender d5 and the remaining piece for black is a dark square bishop and the dark square bishop cannot control d5 so that's the type of uh, reasoning that you want to have and again it's not so much about calculation it's more about awareness of the relationship between uh, the pieces and the role of each single piece in this position so again continue with h3 so missing this opportunity white still has a, a decent position and here there's a very significant mistake um once again it was possible to to capture and uh, and of course black should have captured the knight just to avoid uh, this tactic with bishop f6 but here this move uh, knight b5 is extremely instructive <coughs> excuse me so knight b5 is actually extremely instructive uh, because it's uh, not just a move saying hey i play knight b5 i thought i had something and then after that my opponent played a6 i realized i didn't have anything i had to go back uh, the underlying issue with this move is that out of the opening white doesn't know what to do and uh the move knight b5 itself it's actually a pretty common pattern it will come back in the second game as well um this this move knight b5 really signals lack of understanding of how to create a plan so some of these players again this is perfectly understandable because they have extremely tight schedules and and uh, chess is a very complex game but a lot of these players are given some opening lines but they're not really taught how to create a plan in the middle game and uh, what happens is that right out of the opening, they basically don't know what to do. So it's not about not knowing what to do as in which move to make, but more specifically, uh, how you come up with a good move to make when there is nothing to do. So uh, there's a beautiful saying, which goes, uh, tactics is what you do when there is something to do and strategy is what you do when there is nothing to do. So right now there's nothing to do. You can't, well, Technically, there is. You could win a pawn, but let's say you miss that opportunity. You say, okay, there is no tactic in the position. What do I do? How do I come up with a plan? So here, an idea would really be say, hey, okay, let's think. What are the weaknesses for black? How can I improve my pieces? What are potential squares where my, my knight would like to jump and uh, so on? So which piece I can improve? Which piece is good? Which piece is bad? Uh, where is my pawn structure pointing towards, where is my opponent's pawn structure pointing towards, and so on. So all these different strategic considerations, and as a result of it, coming up with a method really to choose, hey, that's the move I'm gonna make, 
because I'm attending to the strategy of the position. So uh, again, the move might be five is really signaling an underlying lack of uh, understanding or more than understanding, just lack of a method to come up with uh, something to do in uh, the middle game. And of course, the knight just has to go back. And uh, now black takes this knight and uh, just captures the pawn in the center. Now white is still fine here because there is pressure against this uh, d5 pawn. So white can actually win the pawn back. Uh, but that's how the, the game continues here. Uh, after rook a e1, rook e8, uh, a very bad move here, queen e3. So this is a, a major blunder, which uh, basically just decides the game uh, almost on the spot. And uh, once again, there's uh, two components to this blunder. One component is uh, simply missing the fork. So you would realize, okay, I put my queen on a square where uh, it's actually vulnerable because there's another piece that can be forked by the move uh, d4. And so here, the main component of the blunder is uh, failing to see the pattern of the pawn fork. And if you notice something like that in your games, then you definitely want to get more familiar with pawn forks. Just do a lot of tactics that involve pawn forks. You can filter tactics by theme, and that's how you'll get better at that. But the other element is once again not knowing what to do. Like even if this move queen e3 wasn't a blunder, like what is the queen doing on e3 that is not doing on on d2? Uh, the point is here uh, you really want to come up with something constructive to do rather than making random moves. And uh, even if there is nothing immediate to do, one thing, and there isn't any tactic in the position, but hey, where are my pieces better placed? I know I just placed this this rook here, but maybe this rook doesn't belong here. Should we, now that this rook is on e8, controlling uh, the e4 square indirectly after captures, 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 why don't I go to the d1, for example, and uh, put pressure on d5, which again, is, it's the weakness. Understanding this structure means, hey, Look, there is a weakness on d5 because this pawn is a backward pawn right now. How can I pile up against this? Another idea is also to simply play rook e2 and uh, doubling the rooks or bringing the other rook to d1 as well. So that's how you really want to come up with a, with a plan to improve your pieces and, uh, and, and so on. And uh, this mistake just decides the game. And what's instructive is that after a few moves, uh, there is actually another mistake, which again, walks into a fork. And uh, it's exactly the same pattern, it's a pawn fork. So once again, not realizing uh, that these two pieces um, form a configuration where they can be forked by a pawn. So if you notice that you're making similar mistakes in your game, by all means, uh, work the specific tactical pattern. In this case, the theme is pawn fork. It could be anything else, it doesn't matter. You wanna work on your specific weaknesses. And uh, here, okay, we can see how the game continues. Uh, the last mistake we can mention is that here, of course, this position is completely lost for white. But in general, especially considering the clock situation, uh, in this particular game, Wogamama TV playing with the black pieces was significantly low on time. So here it would have made a lot of sense just to create more problems. Uh, to keep pieces on the board. And a move like queen d1, allowing the queen exchange, makes it so easy for the opponent to simplify the position and uh, win very, uh, very easily. So we'll be more testing to keep the piece on the board, for example, just going queen f3 instead of, uh, of queen d1. And of course, the position is still lost, but there are more opportunities for black to go wrong. All of a sudden, black will have nothing immediately obvious uh, to do. And therefore, um, with only a few, say, in particular, I think this position Black had something like 17 seconds on the clock. There was an increment of five seconds per move, but again, at this level, that is a severe time pressure. So really, it would have been a lot more testing to keep more pieces on the board. So in general, if you're trying to save a lost position, uh, keeping the pieces on the board is uh, definitely a strategy that you want to keep in mind. And also not making it easy for the opponent to uh, just uh, just uh, play only moves. So here, capturing this, of course, big mistake. Uh, capturing again, and now this position is extremely easy for black to win, so we'll not spend uh, too much time on that. And uh, the game eventually ended in this position. 
And uh, let's have a quick look at the other game that uh, they played. Of course, now Wogamama TV playing with the white pieces. And uh, we have a London system, symmetrical variation. So far, everything good. And this game was actually played quite well by both players. But here we see the same problem. Same problem as in the last game. Now, this move uh, is actually pretty dubious. And uh, what's interesting about this is not so much you know, the move itself. But the fact that this move follows the same exact pattern as uh, the mistake that we saw in the previous game, the knight b5. So after knight b5, a6, the knight was forced back. And, uh, and that wasn't good. Right now, you can see there is a knight on, uh, on b8 that hasn't been developed yet. And because this knight is not developed, there's a rook here that is also not developed. What is the point of moving the same piece twice in the opening uh, when this piece is not really attacking anything? There is no checkmate threat here because this knight is defending. There's another knight here supporting the, the f3 knight. So really nothing is going to happen regardless. Uh, so this move uh, is, a, is a big mistake because of that. And again, if you see yourself making these mistakes, what you want to do is identify the pattern. Say, hey, I play this uh, knight move when I shouldn't because this knight is not doing anything. And meanwhile, I've got more important things to do with uh, my pieces. And uh, here, there was actually one uh, blunder here, very significant. <laughs> the same thing happened, the knight was kicked back. This time, Afthor noticed that there would have been a fork if he had retreated the knight to f6. So uh, that shows the improvement, you know, seeing the mistake and uh, fixing that on the go. So very good uh, adaptability by the player with the black pieces. And uh, now this game was really decided by a single mistake, I believe. A c5 would be the move to play, noticing that there is pressure on uh, this pawn, which uh, if it's not pushed, it will end up being a backward pawn. Uh, but here, there was a major mistake here, the sequence with, uh, with this f5. And the reason f5 happened, um, in my opinion, I mean, I... I I have no way to know this for sure, but in my opinion, this move happened because the black player was really trying to force the issue as quickly as possible, knowing that uh, he was in a must-win situation. Now, if you're in a must-win situation, feeling the pressure, having to take massive risks when there is no way really to do that productively, uh, it's not really a good strategy. So even if you're in a in a must-win situation, it's easier to win from an equal position than from a lost position. That is a very important principle. It's easier to win from an equal position than from a lost position. So you don't want to ruin your position for nothing uh, just because you have this feeling inside you that you should do something in order, uh, once again, to force the issue and um, uh, get something going. It's better sometimes to wait and uh, maybe your opponent will make a mistake or maybe you'll force the, the matter later on uh, when you can do that um, by creating uh, at least some practical problems. So this move f5 is very risky and it's very weakening, but it doesn't really create any practical problems. So if you are to make a move that is anti-positional like this f5 here, uh, you want to do that if at least it creates uh, some... Um, some trouble to the opponent, at least forces the opponent to make some tough decisions. That's at the very least. Here, White reacted very well. Actually, White played this game extremely well, over 98% accuracy, I believe. So after e5, this queen is short of squares. And uh, what uh, after failed to realize, um, mostly because I believe he was feeling the pressure having to do something here. I failed to realize that white had a threat. In fact, white was threatening e5 and there's no way to keep the queen near the pawn on c7 and uh, therefore now the rook is penetrating and uh, this game was very soon over. There was no other significant mistake in this game. Uh, really, uh, there was, uh, of course, it, it was possible to slow down the mate, but white was going to win anyway because of the passer. So uh, this is um, um, the result. And again, I believe the major blunder here was this uh, move f5 and we explained uh, why I believe that happened. So I hope this uh, was useful. If you've identified some patterns, uh, some uh, decision making uh, mistakes that you have made in your own games or maybe some uh, 
similar dynamics again that you, you either identified in your previous play or maybe that you now notice you're now more aware of and you will be uh, more careful in your future games uh, definitely let me know in the comments so just uh, type a comment and let me know and uh, if you enjoyed this video make sure you subscribe to this channel so hit the subscribe button and uh, i will see you in the very next video